Hey everybody, major reaction coming at you. We're gonna be doing something a little different today. Um, most of you guys might not know that my um, action figure collecting and um, toy photography started about nine years ago now. Eight or nine years ago, I think I started in 2012 or 2013, I started to collect action figures again. And um, then I got into articulated comic book art and started taking um, photos of my toys. So uh, right here we have a setup using some brand new trees and bases. Oh, I see something going weird back there with that um, tree. But using some new trees and bases I got in from my buddy Clayton. I was able to set up this really awesome jungle looking scene uh, with the new raptor I just got in from Gil. Uh, well, he gave me gave me it for free as a gift. Um, the other day we were at a toy show together and uh, it was my first time messing around with one of them and I really liked it. So he's like, dude, you can have it. And I was like, all right, sick. So now I got me a raptor. Uh, so yeah, uh, but I wanted to talk to you guys about where my collecting kind of began. I mean, I used to have toys as a kid, obviously, but um, I didn't take very, very good care of them. And uh, oftentimes they break and stuff like that or get lost. Um, you know, when you're a kid, stuff gets thrown away whenever your mom decides to clean your room. So, yeah, that happened quite often. Um, but when I was not a child and I started collecting, I started collecting um, trading cards. So here we have a new um, trading card game called Flesh and Blood. It's uh, really big in New Zealand and making its way to the U.S. They just had their first um, nationals tournament in the U.S. Um, so it's really gaining steam. Uh, some of these cards can go for a lot of money. So we're going to do a little unboxing here today. Um, just want to kind of gauge your guys' interest on this type of thing. I know like primarily I shoot toys and stuff, but... Like I said, um, my adult collecting began with trading card games. So I was into Magic the Gathering for a long time. Uh, I had a really big Magic collection. At one point, I had enough uh, card boxes to lay on the ground and create like a human out of them. <laughs> like I could, uh, I had enough boxes to create arms, legs, and a torso and a head for you know basically a six foot tall human. So I had a lot of Magic the Gathering cards. Um, I hit a hard time uh, one year and needed some extra money so in order to get the extra money I sold off all my magic collection to a friend who was playing magic at the time uh, all my decks everything down to the last card he made sure to get it all because he knew everything I had I sold it for way less than what the value was I sold it for all all of it for about 300 bucks because you know we were young like People didn't have that much money but the set easily could have been I could have easily sold like all my cards for probably a grand um, so you know hard times desperate times call for desperate measures so you know uh, when I finally got back into a place where uh, money wasn't that big of a deal or where I was like better at actually like budgeting and stuff like that and taking care of you know my responsibilities first um, I got back into collecting and I started off with toys this time because I had found um, a couple YouTubers like Shardimus Prime and um, Boogie ACBA and you know Red Hulk 80. There's a bunch of dudes like when I first started coming up that did collection videos and uh, posing and things like that. And obviously you got your toy reviewers like Shardimus and D Amazing. So I got into toy collecting and then into toy photography and uh didn't really look back at trading cards for a long time um however i did buy some magic cards like a couple years ago i just kind of uh, had a couple friends who were playing again and i wanted to play and you know how that goes like it's hard to play magic sometimes with a group of friends because sometimes they want to play sometimes they don't so in the end we ended up not playing so i bought all these magic cards for no reason uh, but recently i was talking to my buddy seth uh og member of the geek out show and he was telling me about this new 
game. Ooh, nice. Specialization. Uh, this new game called Flesh and Blood. Oh, nice. Three of a kind. Rainbow foil. Mythic. Nice. So, uh, started getting into Flesh and Blood. Put that one off to the side. That might be worth something. Oh, so the set I'm opening right here is called Arcane Rising. Now, um, primarily when I first got into this, Seth was like, you know, go for the first edition stuff. So I was buying Tales of Aria. I bought two booster boxes of Tales of Aria. Um, ended up pulling a really good card. It was um, uh, Crown of Seeds, a cold foil. So when I first pulled it, it was worth about 220 Now it's worth about 150 See, that's the thing with cards, and that's kind of why I got out in the first place is because some cards create an outrageous demand and then a month or two later it's like worthless basically so it goes out of rotation a rotation or it can be banned so sometimes cards can lose value quite easily in this area I think she's an archer and a ranger um, so some cards can lose value quite quickly so that's why um, to me card collecting in general wasn't I mean I don't really for the toys that I'm collect you know for resale I collect more because I do something with them like I uh, take photos and that was the hard thing about getting back into cards too was because when I collected Magic the Gathering it was because I was playing Magic the Gathering um, I used to collect Pokemon Digimon and Yu-Gi-Oh as well uh, with Pokemon and Digimon I never learned how to play those games uh, they always seemed way too I don't know, different, because I was so used to the magic set system with um, permanent land bases and things like that, that it was hard for me to uh, step away from that style of gameplay. So going into something like Digimon or Pokemon, where the gameplay style is a lot different, I was always uh, intimidated or put off, so I never learned those games. But um, I wanted to play Flesh and Blood. I'm still working at getting a little better at it. I've only played a few times with another person at a um, game store here in Manteca. Uh, gamers path so I've been down there a couple times uh, there's a guy named Matt <laughs> go figure who plays down there and uh, we met up and played today and uh, it kicked my butt pretty good so went home reworked my decks um, obviously I'm buying some new stuff so reworked my decks that's a cool card out right there you can see that little sun in the middle it's pretty cool um, Oh, it's a foil, that's why. Okay, I was like, it's doing like some weird effect. I was like, oh, it's because it's foil. Um, so yeah, I've learned to play this game. So it gives me a reason to like, collect, because I actually am going to do something with them. Um, and not just sell them off. But my one of my goals with this game was to, if I did get a high price card, was to get rid of it. So I could fund buying more cards, or at least get my money back from the cards I bought. Um, obviously, I pulled that crown of seeds, and it's kind of hard to find people. I mean, I don't like selling online that often, just because I don't know um, all the fees and things that they end up getting with you. Um, but when you don't have like an actual base of customers or people that are interested in, you know, a new up-and-coming trading card game, it's really hard to sell a card like crown of seeds for two hundred dollars. So. Um, I might hold on to it. It actually is a really good equipment card and it has a lot of use and who knows, uh, the value could go back up depending on how much play it gets when Tales of Aria becomes an actual, like, constructed uh, part of rotation. Because right now it just basically got, it basically just did like the release for it like a couple months ago. So people are still getting like used to playing with Tales of Aria. So this is an older um, set, this is called Arcane Rising, the reason I picked these ones up is because the set was announced to be out of print now, so I figured I might as well pick up a booster box and just check them out. Um, there might, I might get some cards in here that might not be reprinted for a while, so went ahead and bought a box. Found a pretty cheap box online. Ooh, nice, this looks cool. I want to say this is specialization, but I don't see anywhere in there that it is a specialization. Pursuit of knowledge. See, that's the one thing too, is they kind of revamped, at least with the Tales of Aria, they kind of revamped the styles. So there's some things in these older deck, uh, older cards that aren't in the newer cards, or that are different. Like uh, this Mechanologist, 
that wasn't a part, that's not a part of the Tales of Aria set. In the Tales of Aria set, there's only a, a Rune Blade, a Ranger, and a Guardian, and a, shh, wait, no, Leviathan's not from that, so, yeah, um, I think those are the three heroes, I think there's one more hero, I might be forgetting, but, this set seems to have some other people like Wizards, um, has a Rune Blade in here. A lot of generic stuff that can be used across classes. See, the cool thing about Flesh and Blood is unlike uh, Magic, the Gathering, where you have, uh, in order to play cards, here, let me find a card first. Okay. So, um, in Flesh and Blood, you start off with a hero character. I play Blitz um, primarily because you know, it only requires a 40 card deck in a shorter game, it's usually a 20 to 30 minute game. Um, you can play with the adult version of a hero, which has 40 life. So down here you'll see the life total well, typically has 40 life. The Blitz version only has 20 life, half the life. Um, intellect is 4, so that's the amount of cards you're going to draw at the end of every turn, is 4. Um, and basically the way it plays is you play your hero and all your cards in your deck are based on what your hero is. So Viserai is a rune blade, so he can only have rune blade cards in his deck or generic action cards um, and only equipments. Well, um, most of the equipment is, you know, usable for most people except for like the weapons. So you have to find like a rune blade weapon. Um, and then the rest of your deck is loaded up with attack spells and action spells. So basically, attack actions and non-attack actions. And um, the way to defeat a player is to bring down their life total to zero. So when you're playing in Blitz, you basically have to do 20 points of damage or more, depending on if they have life gain abilities. And, um, and that's how the game's played. And it gets really tense right when they get down to like the last couple life, because you can get somebody down to like under six. So the games can go on for a while and it gets really intense when you get down to like the last life because even if you get them down to less than six life and you think you got the game in the bag, a player can pull out a play that'll just bring you down like, you know, a lot of life at one time and basically steal the game from you. Um, there's a lot of different types of decks and ways to play the game. There's a lot of ping decks that just kind of do arcane damage. There's a lot of like brute decks that do overwhelming damage with dominate so that you can't block it with more than one um, defense card. And the cool thing about this card game is that it actually utilizes a lot of different, there's a lot of things going on with the card. So let me show you this card for uh, instance. So Searing Shot, okay? So up here at this um, left hand corner you have a pitch value. So if you pitch this card, which is basically like a, vert, a form of discarding, but instead of going into a discarding pile where it's not going to be used again, when you pitch a card, at the end of your turn it goes back under your deck. So it's going to come back eventually if the game goes on long enough. So one of the primary ways to play Flesh and Blood is to know what you're pitching and pitch things that are going to be resourceful to you later in the game. So this is the pitch value, so if I was to pitch this I would get two like um, resource points. This is the play cost, which is zero, so if I wanted to play this, I could play this for zero. So I wouldn't have to pitch anything to play this. Um, it's an attack action. It's a ranger attack, so it's an arrow. So with uh, rangers, rangers can only fire arrows if they're loaded in their arsenal. And the arsenal, the way the arsenal works is you can only put one card in your arsenal at the end of your turn unless you have cards that otherwise put cards into your arsenal. So most bows, there's bows that have effects that'll put a card from your hand into your arsenal and then give it an ability. Um, so this thing can be played as an attack for three, uh, three damage, that's the attack base value. It's for zero cost. Or if it's in your hand and somebody's gonna do damage to you, you can use it to defend for the three cost defense down there for zero. So when you get attacked, you can use hands in your card, in your hand to block the enemy's attack. You, with uh, these symbols. So any card that has this symbol can be used to block. Not all cards have that symbol, so some cards are more useful than others. And that's the really cool thing about Flesh and Blood is it's very deep, um, but at times it can be very simple as well. Um, the overall idea of the game is pretty simple, um, but there's a lot of complexity in the way you play and everything. But uh, it's a really fun game. 
if you're into TCGs, I would highly suggest getting into this um, sooner than later because right now it's still at a pretty cheap retail value. The, re uh, the retail on the boxes goes for under $100 mostly. Um, now the unlimited ones are always in print, except for obviously Arcane Rising is now going out of print, which they just announced. But uh, unlimited basically means it's not first edition, so it's constantly being printed now. And uh, let's see what else. Yeah, so the unlimited's cheaper. First edition will be a little more expensive. The only first edition you can get right now at, a, at basically retail price would be Tales of Aria. If you're trying to get Arcane Rising uh, first edition, you're probably going to be paying three to four hundred dollars per booster box, where it's normally under a hundred dollars. So you got to kind of think about what you're going to do. If you're going to just play with them, I would suggest Unlimited. If you're trying to look into selling possibilities, first edition is the only way to go. All right, let's open up one more pack, and then um, I'm going to let you guys, you know, um, tell me what you think. If you guys want to see more videos like this, where I unbox and kind of talk about um, trading card games and the rules and things, or even maybe do a couple matches with uh, my fellow, um, my OG Geek Out Show host, uh, Seth, because he also plays Flesh and Blood. If you guys would like to see something like that, we could record that and put it on the channel. But I just kind of want to know what you guys think before, otherwise we'll just go back to doing toy stuff, because I know, you know, there's a whole other game. And obviously I'm going to tell you guys if I find something that looks rare and important. So, uh, one other thing with the card, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this very well, but down here at the very bottom, it uh, there's a letter. So, uh, C means common, um, R means rare, this one's rare, uh, M means mythic, or not mythic, uh, mystique, or mis uh, mystic, no, something weird, they call it something really weird. It's not mythic, because that's a magic term, it's majestic, there you go, majestic. Um, and then they also have L for Legendary. In this set, they seem to have S, which I thought meant Specialization, but then I found a card just a minute ago that didn't have any Specialization in the card text, so who knows. But yeah, Le and Legendary would be like, and then there's Fabled also, which I haven't had the pleasure of pulling a Fabled item yet because those are super rare. The one Fabled from Tales of Aria goes for over $600, so... Just a little perspective to put it in for you. Like this is a fairly new game, and it's already you know commanding pretty high grade prices. Yeah. All right, well thanks for watching, you guys. Um, like I said, if you guys want to see some actual play gameplay, I could always do a test run by myself just to show you the mechanics of the game, or I can um, bring on my buddy Seth and we can do a full on game. Um, there's also some other TCGs that I. There's also another TCG that I got into. Um, it's called Universes, but they just released a My Hero Academia set. So that's what I'm really excited to, uh, I've been really excited opening up those cards. They're really nice looking art and, um, they're just really, they're, I mean, they're more recognizable to me because I already know the characters from My Hero Academia. So, you know, it's a, it's a good way to get collectors who probably aren't into trading card games into one because you're using you know something as popular as my hero academia and you're going to be pulling like a whole brand new crowd um yeah so that's it you guys have a great day and um take care